Yeah, at least I can. So, 
Yes. Okay. Good evening. Please, can we, can I have your attention? Uh, you're welcome. Please let us take our seats. My name is Steven Enada. On behalf of the Maya Foundation, the International Committee on Nigeria, and Save the Persecuted Christians, we welcome you to this evening of deliberating on faith over fear, Leah Sharibo, religious prisoner of conscience enslaved by ISIS. Everybody, everywhere in the world, when Leah Sharibu, a teenager, was abducted from her school with other students, she was asked and pressured to deny her faith. She refused. She was abducted and sold as a sex slave. This is one of the egregious atrocities that has been committed over the world and what has happened in Lake Chad region, especially in Nigeria, where thousands of girls have been abducted by ISIS, Boko Haram, and other non-state actors. So we are gathered here today to echo this voice that this teenager represents. She refused fear over faith. She stood by that. And we are here this evening. The Leia Foundation has brought us all together because they have not stopped sending these messages, representing other girls that have been sold across the Mediterranean. We thank God for Dr. Gloria Pudu, my dear friend and my dear friend Didi Logerson, who actually have been holding this torch, that this voice will not be drowned, that this voice will be heard. Even as Nigeria government has failed and other faith institutions have failed this teenager, she will never be forgotten. We are here today to celebrate that doggedness this teenager exuded when she was abducted. She would have converted to Islam, but she stood. What most of us, including me, would have, maybe I would have denied Jesus. So this evening we are here as a moderate, and we listen to everyone present here tonight. We are going to see how everybody will be that touch like Vera on behalf of these guests. So I welcome Dr. Gloria Pudu, the Executive Director of the Lea Sharibu Foundation. You are welcome, man. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and I am glad to be here. So good evening all, and my fellow panel members, I want to use this opportunity to say thank you very much for honoring us. It's a great privilege to have amazing, high-placed people like you willing to stand with us and to speak. And this is not the first time you had been doing it in the UK, in the US, and all of you are here today. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, quickly, I know we have their names in front. So Stephen, um, maybe when you come here, if you'll just quickly give each one's biography. Well, I'm the president of the Foundation, like he said, and it's a pleasure for me to be able to stand and advocate for this young child who has faith truly was over fear. 
she stood in the face of these terrorists and looked at them at 14 years old. And then she said, no, I will not renounce Christ. So as far as we are concerned, Leah represents the faces of all those who are persecuted for their faith, especially the Christian faith in Nigeria. And also, at 14 years old, we know that this child should be in school. She was abducted in school. And so Leah also represents the faces of all girls who are denied education in Nigeria. And so when we speak about Leah, we were so glad when 104 girls who she was abducted with came out and gave us the news that one child stood and said, I will not come out because I've been told to renounce my faith. And so that name gave us the opportunity to speak about our plight. We know we have thousands of girls, thousands of school children who today are out of school because of the activities of Boko Haram. And Boko Haram, we know, as far as we are concerned, has made Nigeria to be the epicenter of, you know, um, terrorist breeding ground. So the world needs to turn their eyes. Now that Middle East has some relief from ISIS, turn your eyes to Nigeria because that is the new breeding ground. And we need you to stand with us, to speak with us, and to help us using Leah Sharibu as a child representing the Muslims, the Christians, the non-Christians or Muslims, the traditionalists, as a child in Nigeria, going through the difficulties that they are going through. Nigerian women are paying a great price. We are crying because our children are abducted, they are raped, they are enslaved, and made to become sex slaves, changed from one man to the other, and not just normal men who are gentlemen like you sitting down here, but terrorists without any human feeling. We are told that Leah has two children. A lot of Chibok girls who have been able to escape, recently two of them, Mary and Hawa, came out and told us terrifying stories about how they are treated how traumatized they are on a daily basis. And we need to speak up and we need to stand and we need to say, look, you need to come and help us. How do I want us to help? How do I want you as an international community to help us? I will quickly go through it because I don't want to repeat the stories. We already know the horrific things and the fellow panelists have a lot to speak. But one thing I want to plead with you is that we need you to speak up and ask the Nigerian government, what are they doing about stopping terrorism in Nigeria? If they are not able to do it, can they ask for help so that the international community can together put and mobilize special forces that will be able to fight the way ISIS has been fought, let the entire world turn their face on Nigeria and support the Nigerian government. As far as we are concerned, they have failed to do that or they are unwilling to do it, whichever way. We will also want to plead with the international community. First of all, Nigeria has been removed from the country of particular concern. Why has it been removed from country of particular concern? When the atrocities are on the increase rather than decrease. So we need to ask the government to place back Nigeria on the country of particular concern because that will help to stop or to check what the government will be doing. And then for us, removing it is like thumbs up to the terrorists. And we saw an increase from 2021, 2022, in the atrocities that have been committed. Recently, we saw how, I can count the number of bishops who have been slaughtered and killed, who have been abducted. So we need to bring that to four. I will also want to plead with you that you can also ask where are the weapons coming from? Who is funding it? What are they doing? It? They need to stop them so that we will be able to have peace. 
Thank you very much, so that I don't take so much time so others will be able to speak. I could take questions and give more details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gloria Pudu. Um, we are amazed by what you do, speaking on behalf of Leah Sharibu and other uh, guests that have been abducted. And thank you for holding in. So our panelists will be having uh, five minutes each to make their presentation so that we save uh, time because it's been a long day. Now we have with us member of the UK House of Commons, 1979 to 1997, independent life peer crossbench member of the House of Lords. In no other person than Lord David Alton coming from London. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Gloria. The very first people I met when I arrived here last night were Stephen and his colleagues. And one of them said to me, you were very encouraging to us because of the posts that you put up on your website about Nigeria and about Leah Sharibu. And I said, you are very encouraging to me because of the way that you have stood up for your faith in Nigeria. And you've taught us so much about what we take for granted in so many of the countries in which we live. I was very pleased to hear Gloria speak because last week I sort of met another Gloria. I went to the opening of an exhibition in Parliament at Westminster called Tears of Gold. And a young woman artist, a brilliant young woman, called uh, Helen, H Hannah Thomas, Hannah Thomas, had painted the pictures of women whose tears had been shed because of their experiences. They were pictures of Afghan women. They were pictures of Ukrainian women. They were pictures of Rohingya women. They were pictures of Yazidi women. And they were pictures of Nigerian women. And underneath their pictures, there were stories. And I read the story of a Nigerian woman who had not been raped once, but had been raped twice. And by the group of Fulani militia who'd come into her village and her home. She was eight months pregnant. Remarkably, her husband, who was forced to watch this take place, after the marauders had left, took her to the hospital. And the baby was born. And they called her their miracle baby, and they named her Gloria. So I met another Gloria again tonight. These star stories are all too real, and they are the reason why we don't forget Leah Sharibu. Leah's mother, Rebecca, came as my guest and the guest of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Freedom of Religion or Belief, which I helped to found at Westminster, and which is co-chaired by my great friend and colleague, Baroness Cox, Caroline Cox, some of you know Caroline, who was in Nigeria recently, and who now, in <laughs> she won't thank me for saying this, but having passed her 80th year, still campaigns and works as hard, putting her life on the line as she ever did. And Caroline and I, with Fiona Bruce, Member of Parliament, who will next week host the Ministerial in London, where I'm glad to say Nigeria will again feature. We shared a platform with Rebecca, and we told Leah's story. And it's the story that Stephen and Gloria and all of you have told again and again and know so well. But I promised Rebecca that night that as long as I have breath in me, I will never lose an opportunity to remind people of her fate because she is, as Gloria has said, she is representative of all the women, all the girls, all the people who suffer for their faith the world over. Just before walking into this room this evening, I was privileged to talk to two women, one from India, one from Pakistan, and with Dr. Ohab who's on the platform this evening. We've just published literally this week a new book on the subject of genocide. We tell the story, and we're writing a report, continuing to write a report at the moment about Pakistan women and girls who are abducted, forcibly married, many of them abused, some of them as young as 12 years of age. And Maryam is on the, 
on the platform here tonight. And she knows, I know that hers was a case again, which I became involved in because of the suffering that she was personally experiencing because of her face. These iconic women tell their story. They are the women who stand at the foot of the cross. And often they shape fame us men who talk a lot, but who disappear when they are needed. So thank you for your courage. Thank you for what you have said to us. Thank you for the challenges that you've handed down. Leah represents everyone who's persecuted. She represents, as you've heard, all those who are denied an education. What, does the, what do the words Boko Haram actually mean? They mean destroy Western education. This is what the Taliban are trying to do in Afghanistan, and denying women an education. It's what all of these organizations, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, West Africa, uh, uh, ISIS West Africa, Boko Haram, all of them are committed to the same ideology. And we must call this out for what it is. When policymakers who take a country like Nigeria off the list of concerned countries, it is because they are obsessed with their own forms of ideology and that will tell you that population control or poverty or climate change is the reason for the problems that face countries like Nigeria. Or climate change does not walk into a church in the south of the country and murder more than 40 people. It doesn't turn up on Christmas Day and execute 11 Christians. It doesn't pull down and burn down people's homes and their churches. And imputing a moral equivalence as well by saying basically they're all as bad as one another. If I hear this kind of nonsense from any more policymakers, it will drive me to distraction, which is why it's so important to hold events like this, so that we can change the narrative and name the ideology for what it is. Now, Maryam, of course, knows a lot about Sudan. I went to Sudan during the Sudanese war. Two million people died. Why did they die? Faith is at the fact that knows the answer to this question better than many in this room. They died because of the ideology that Khartoum was trying to impose on the people of the South, who were primarily Christians, animists, and people of traditional Muslim backgrounds. What happened in Darfur? I was the first parliamentarian to go into Darfur. 300,000 people were killed by that ideology. Two million people were displaced. And what he ended up doing was to destroy the country of Sudan, which was partitioned in the end. The same thing will happen to Nigeria unless Buhari and his government see the ideology for what it is that they have far too long collaborated with, in my view, leading to disastrous consequences. I helped to publish a report in 2020 on Nigeria, an unfolding genocide, question mark. Well, I don't think we need the question mark anymore. We have seen the consequences. I saw a report that was published by, in 2020 by World Watch, monitor who said that Boko Haram had killed more people than ISIS in Syria and Iraq combined. Read Rabbi Abraham Cooper and Reverend Johnny Moore's book with its 15 recommendations. It's entitled The Next Jihad. The Jihad is upon us. 2014, 276 girls from Chibok. 2018, 110 from Dapchi, including Leah. 2021, I stood with Mervyn Thomas and others in London outside the Nigerian High Commission in London. We put shoes on the pavement to represent the shoes of the little children who've been abducted from those schools. That is what we must do more of. We have got to push this issue right up, right up the, uh, the, the index. We've got to make people aware. It's costing the economy of Nigeria 10.5 billion pounds a year, but what it's costing in lives what it's costing in communities, what it's costing in homes, what it's costing for families like that of Rebecca Caribou is incalculable. That is why we have to redouble our efforts. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Atom. Yeah, last night, uh, when I saw you, I quickly punched my phone. I sent email to Baron Ocos and I say, you are here, he says, Stephen, He's going to speak my mind and never disappoint you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, are, we appreciate your effort. Uh, this time around, uh, I would like to, you have heard like three weeks ago, 
there was Catholic Diocese of Ondo, Nigeria, who oversees the Church of St. Francis. You know, I, I, sorry, please forgive me. 40 people were killed while worshiping God on Pentecost Sunday. It can be anyone. This evening, I'm introducing the bishop of this church, seeing his parishion has been gone down as Florida. Please welcome with me, Bishop Jude Arogondari. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin in a very funny way. There is no human development that has ever happened without human will and human determination. In fact, every scientific discovery, every human endeavors, the first person that flew the plane across the Atlantic, imagine his level of will and determination. At the end of the day, it is human will and determination that will conquer the world. And on that note, I am Bishop Jude Ayodeji Arogundade, the Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Ondo that was attacked on Pentecost Sunday by a group of Fulani headsmen, the militant group came into the church just as the mass was concluding and wanted to kill everybody. They practically went there to kill everybody. And just about five minutes after that, they called me because the seat of the bishop, which is Akure, is about 35 uh, minutes drive to our walk where this happened. I got there. What I saw was unbelievable, beyond any human imagination. It's not what anybody wants to see. That people will go as far as blowing off the head of two-year-old boy or girl. If I show you some pictures, some of you will, will vomit, we will, will throw up. And I felt that what are we dealing with here? What is this? How did we get to this point? You need to understand the politics of Nigeria. For more than 200 years, somebody started a jihad. A jihad that many of you in Nigeria knows about, the Utmanda Folio Jihad. And that has always been the reference point of many uh, uh, fanatics and terrorists who wants to expand the caliphate. They want to expand uh, the caliphate to conquer the entire Nigeria uh, as a country. And in doing that, they have tried everything, including different kinds of riots. And the undertone of all this is about expanding that caliphate. And so, even when they kidnap your, a child, turn her to slave, as we have with uh, the Isharibu and so many other guests, you come to realize that it is the act of intimidation, the act of suppression, the act of humiliation, the act of evil that we are dealing with. And when we have a system that is a bit, you know, tending towards aiding these terrorists, it becomes something else. 
even to the point now I've started to call the Nigerian government of today uh, uh, full any, I mean, full any headsmen backed by the government. That's what we are seeing. Because if they are not backed, how will they go to that extent? My goodness, Nigeria is a regional power. When it comes to Africa, Nigeria has the strongest military. For some group of thugs coming from nowhere, frustrating Nigerian military, it's unbelievable, it's unacceptable. It is something that can be, uh, that can be confronted that, no, this is not possible. Nigeria went to uh, Liberia, liberated that country, uh, Syria alone, and many other countries in Africa. So what are we talking about? What are we dealing with? The fundamental uh, thing that we are dealing with here is this. You know, when you place ideology beyond human life, it becomes something else. In Christianity, and I know it's not everybody here that is Christian, in Christianity, life is the ultimate, is the highest good, is the greatest good. And every ideology is in service of life. Our Christian schools, our hospitals, our theology, our social work, everything we do is to enhance life, is to make life much more uh, valuable, is to make life the ultimate. But when you turn that around to say ideology is now the ultimate, but life is in service of ideology, then it becomes something else. And that is what we are dealing with here. And that was, that was the reason why I started the way I did. That human will and determination must be ready to change, to destroy, and to educate humanity than that life must be the ultimate goal of everyone to make life more beautiful and more acceptable. What is the solution? I don't want to know, I only have five minutes. What is the solution of what we are dealing with? I can tell you and I can look you in the face. I can look uh, President Biden in the face and say, Biden, if you stand up today and call the president of Nigeria and say, I want this to stop, it will stop. It will stop. So why, why are we here? How do we get him to do that? So this is the task before us. I beg you in the name of God. If there's anything you can do after washing the blood and the body of 40 people just last two weeks in St. Francis Church of Work, my own diocese, My, my work, my job have been, have been cut out for me. My mission in life has been entrusted to me. And that mission is to see that every minute, every moment of my life will be spent in working to make sure that that does not happen again. And whatever it takes, I will give it. Remember, some of you must have read when the president of Ireland was talking about climate change and immediately wrote him. I wrote immediately a press release. And it was building up a kind of serious environment in Ireland. In less than three, four days, he apologized. He wrote a strong letter to apologize to Nigeria and to the Diocese of Fondo. And that is what we are talking about. <laughs> but how to get people of this nature People who govern the world, people whose world count, 
to look at the Nigerian authority in the face and say, I want you, we want you to submit the names of those who are, I mean, there are more AK-47 in the hands of the Fulani headsmen than the military of Nigeria today. Who is arming them? They don't have the money to buy anything, to buy those uh, arms. So who is arming them? Until we identify who is doing this and bring them to justice, then we'll just be talking in the air. And once you are able to identify them and ask for accountability, all this will stop. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, my Lord Bishop. Uh, that is uh, great to hear from you. That is a life account of what happened, transpired in Nigeria a few weeks ago. Um, we have our, our panelists uh, would like to manage our time within five minutes, please. Um, I don't want to stand up to, <laughs> to stop you. So we have uh, another great uh, human rights advo advocate and author, in person of Dr. Uelina Yu Ochab. Sorry if I mispronounced that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for organizing this important session, uh, focus on La Sharibu, but also on the persecuted Christians and other religious minorities in Nigeria. And it is very difficult to follow such incredible speakers and the stories such as from, from Bishop Jude, um, because I'll be talking about law. And I'll be talking about boring legal aspects that don't matter much when we talk about the horrible um, atrocities that are happening in Nigeria. And, and Bishop Jude asked for a solution. It is definitely not a solution. I'm not going to talk about solution, but it is one of the tools at our disposal that we should make the best of. And there are three aspects that I would like to focus on. And the first is in relation to the specific targeting of Christians in Nigeria. The second is in relation to the work done by the International Criminal Court. And the third will be on a UN mechanism that we urgently need to look into the situation in Nigeria. And in relation to the specific uh, targeting of Christians, Lord Alton already mentioned that uh, the all-party parliamentary group on, on freedom of religion and belief together with Lord Alton, Baroness Cox, and many others, have been working on producing a report about uh, the, how to categorize the atrocities happening in Nigeria. And of course, the word genocide was one uh, that was used there with a question mark, but again, as Lord Alton mentioned, we, possibly we should remove this question mark. And I think, of course, we can discuss whether the atrocities amount to genocide or not, whether we can see the all legal elements of, of genocide as per Article 2 of the Genocide Convention. But ultimately, at this stage, it does not really matter in terms of the duty to prevent genocide is not triggered when we finally recognize the atrocities as genocide. The duty to prevent is to be triggered when we see the serious risk of genocide. So again, we don't necessarily have to go through the whole analysis whether the atrocities amount to genocide, where there is a risk of genocide, serious risk of genocide. That's when the duty to prevent is to be triggered. When we already know that genocide is happening, what can we do? We can stop it, of course, but ultimately we cannot prevent it. And if we learn anything from the Nazi atrocities, if we learn anything from, from the promises of never again, never again, is we need to do better in order to prevent when we see the risk, the serious risk of genocide, and to do everything what we can in order to prevent the materialization of this risk. That's what the Genocide Convention is all about. But we very often forget about it. And we focus on whether the atrocities are genocide or not. And for example, in the UK, that's a very heated topic. And the UK government always says that it is not for politicians, it's not for governments to determine whether the atrocities amount to genocide or not, it's for courts. And we've been trying to explain again and again that by the time we see a court recognizing the atrocities as genocide, it's too late. Um, so we need to do more. And, and indeed, Lord Alton has been raising this issue several times. Um, if you Google Lord Alton's name or in Hansard, uh, 
factors a lot, a lot, a lot on the situation in Nigeria. But also Lord Alton asked a very important question, uh, and that was in relation to what kind of assessment uh, the Nigerian, uh, the UK government has done in relation to the serious risk of genocide in Nigeria. And the answer was very political, which um, once you summarize it, it says, no, we haven't done it. But of course, that's not how uh, the UK government um, describes it. But very briefly, I'll just move to um, what is being done by the International Criminal Court, because we know that the International Criminal Court is looking into the atrocities and has been looking into the atrocities since 2010. And after 10 years of looking into the situation, they finally concluded that, yes, we can proceed with investigations. 10 years. And among the atrocities, of course, the targeting, the religious targeting is among those atrocities. Um, but unfortunately, right now, nothing is happening. And when we had a meeting with the ICC some months ago, one of the reasons was that the ICC um, knows that the Nigerian government is currently looking into some atrocities perpetrated in Nigeria. And ultimately, it means that before they can proceed with um, request for authorization from the pre-trial chambers, they need to make sure that once they ask for this authorization, it's going to succeed. And because Nigerian government says that they're doing some kind of investigations, that prevents the next step from being taken. That's the usual response. But and I know that the time is ticking, and, um, but there's still one point that I wanted to make. Um, and of course, we know that the ICC will at some point look into the atrocities. I think that's very clear. But ultimately, we shouldn't put all eggs in one basket. I mean, ICC is one of the things that we can explore. But ultimately, the ICC is not going to answer to all our problems. And the ICC, ultimately, what they can do is to identify a few people most responsible for the atrocities. Few people. And they will proceed with, with, with prosecutions. What about the thousands and thousands of perpetrators? And that should be really our focus. And that's the reason one of the proposals that we should be working on and the next steps we should be working on is really to establish a UN mechanism to collect, preserve evidence of the atrocities. And that's indeed what we've been working with, with um, Holda from, from the Jubilee campaign. Uh, we've been looking into how to do it and drafting a proposal to make sure that this is the next step, that we'll have a mechanism that will collect and preserve the evidence of the atrocities. Even if prosecutions, domestic prosecutions are unlikely at this stage, the situation may change in the future. And if you preserve evidence right now, there is some hope for the future, for, for, for the trials in the future, some kind of justice in the future. So, and, and without this evidence, of course, we can't do anything. So this is the next step that we need to take. We can talk about, of course, legal avenues um, for justice. But again, this is just a very boring um, speech about the legal avenues we can explore and what we can do. But ultimately, this is just one tool, one way how we can address the situation. But more and more needs to be done. But thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Ochap, I would like to thank you for everything you have been doing. I've been supporting even PSD, our sister organization in the UK, and I appreciate that. And also uh, our friend and colleague, Abu Ada, of the Jubilee campaign, I know when Abu Ada told me in 2016 that uh, ICC is saying that uh, they lack staff to, to even open the docket. See how uh, reprehensible that can be. So, but we will not be tired when you have somebody like you. So we appreciate your effort. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you see, this time around, this is also an emotional moment for me. Anytime we speak, I have some people I will recognize in our audience who are actually doing certain things. I can see Reverend Andre Mahama and their Pastor Ntuai Godalo, but time will come for that. Uh, <clears throat> this is a lady, if you hear her story, most of us, we hear uh, about Sudan. I have heard first time her name in the mouth of Senator John Danforth. And you guys will know, for those who know Senator John Danforth, when she mentioned, I was like Googling, trying to know who this woman is. She's religious uh, uh, prisoner of conscience in Sudan. 
Marian Ibrahim Ishag is Director of Global Mobilization, Ari Al Nisa Foundation. Please, you are welcome, ma. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and I'm very uh, humble to stand here and to join this wonderful panelist and to talk about Nigeria and about the um, I'm Brian Fisran, Craig, and I'm uh, mother of two, Leah, always in our prayer, morning, night. When I put my children to bed, we pray for me. Yeah. Because um, around this time, when I was released, or the, the US Embassy, just around this time, uh, eight years ago. So I remember watching in the news the people girls being released and I see people are rejoicing and happy. Those girls are released. And I was in my mind as a mother thinking of like, we are happy they are released, but no one ever come after them. So it's holding, abducting them. Like, how do we know they are safe? What they face during the time of the abduction? And I was thinking at the same time, like I'm in prison, I was released from prison, not knowing what would happen to me. I wasn't even allowed to go to my house. I have to seek refuge as yes, and in Khartoum at that time. So at the embassy, I'm watching, like, if I am a mother, and here is my daughter, I don't even know if I will survive this situation, I would never let my daughter go to school in that country. I would never let my daughter go to school. And then by the time my children grew up, and we see Leon start talking about the situation, my son came to me, Mom, why, is they, why are the bad guys kidnapping the student from the school? with weapon and their all this ugly situation, I was saying, I say, because the terror, their weakness is the education. Because when you have educated mother and educated girls, they won't fall to the trap of the terrorists. And you see the situation went from kidnapping student from the school to killing a student classmate. They keep blaming it every time someone else, they send the gang, the terrorist. And at the end, student, classmate, shoulder by shoulder, sitting in the same classroom, killing one another. And as the reason for that, that's girl, she's a Christian. The fact that she is a Christian, her only crime is she is refused to accept the word that has been said to her. Because she's Christian, we have a different faith. So that's what is happening. And then at the same time, thank you, Lord Anton. I really do appreciate all your efforts in Nigeria. I follow up all the things you do. And when we, uh, I, the same thing also, I have seen the world leader had cried about my situation. I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm grateful for that, but there's always a question in my mind why are these girls not matter? like I do. I want to see the same carrot. I want to see the same way they, stand, they stood up for me, for my children during my trial. I want to see the same for Leah and for other girls and for the Nigerian, for the Christian in Nigeria, and for all the spirit leader. So and that's um, I will <laughs> end my talk here. But thank you, Lord, I really appreciate that. And we are very um, uh, encouraged you know that you stand with us. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. Even with the persecution you face in the hand of terrorists, your spirit was not broken, and we are still speaking today. You stand this tall. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. <laughs> yes, uh, I was told that. Uh, I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce you shortly, but you know what? I'm a bad. I'm a Baptist, and then uh, also I'm in Nigeria. My country of origin is Nigeria. I want to thank the United States for giving me this opportunity.
opportunity to live in this country, but also uh, my spirit has always been Nigeria. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> so well, I have a, I have a, His Eminence, the leader of all the churches in Nigeria here present with us, the Campus Christian Association of Nigeria in person of Reverend Dr. Ayokunle. We'll recognize you, sir, and we'll bring you to this podium. You will uh, speak and encourage us when it matters. But this time around, uh, this is an amazing lady, a friend. <laughs> I, I, I Sometimes when I think about you, I just don't know where I'm you are just, you know what? We're walking from Senate building to house office, back and forth, back and forth, and I was tired. I couldn't walk again, and I saw you going. I said, who is this lady? What an amazing spirit. <laughs> so, and uh, you really did so much. Imagine fitting those meetings, imagine meeting those senators, meeting those Congress members. Didi, thank you so much. Didi. So Didi is a sister. She is the executive director of Save the Persecuted Christians. You have the floor. Thank you. Hi, praise from my very dear friend, Stephen Anato, International Committee on Nigeria. They're doing uh, the most amazing work for the people of Nigeria, and it is an honor and a privilege to stand with them and do whatever I can to help out as well. Um, Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world, but this is an inconvenient fact that is ignored by the international community, it is ignored by mainstream media, and every day, 360 million Christians, according to the latest Open Doors USA World Watch report, are heavily persecuted in the top 50 countries where persecution is present. 360 million like an insane number that is more than the population of the United States of America. For every man, woman, and child in this great United States, there is a persecuted Christian out there who doesn't know if they're going to make it through the day. Their properties are stripped from them. They're marginalized in their communities. They're discriminated against for employment and education. They are uh, forcibly detained. They are raped, tortured, murdered and nobody takes note because for eight of the top 10 of those countries are Islamic Republic. For Christians, for more than 80% of the persecuted Christians in the world, the issue is the ideology of Islam, Sharia supremacy that seeks to elevate one religion, one faith group, over that of all of the rest. And we cannot continue down this road and not speak out. I am an official Islamophobe. I have been labeled, I am, uh, I, I am not. I am very good friends with Muslims. I advocate daily for Uyghur Muslims, Rohingya Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, others, but for the persecuted Christians, that's what Save the Persecuted Christians is about. We are a coalition of civil society and faith groups who have come together to elevate the reality of persecuted Christians. In 2018, when we started this work, those numbers were at 215 million. That is a 67% increase in four years' time, and no one is saying anything about it. These are my brothers and sisters. And I love each and every one of them, like I love Leah. I have said her name and prayed for her over the years so many times. And having come to know her mother, Rebecca, I feel as though Leah is my own daughter. I am the mother to six sons. I don't have a daughter. But if I did, Leah would be her. Last year at this time, we had a panel, and Dr. Gloria brought me Leah's book, 
book, which she has some copies of. I'm sorry I didn't bring it down. But I read it again on the way here on my, on my plane. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Leia herself and what happened that day. The night before the terrorists came to her school, Leia was doing what she did. She was the chairman of her Christian fellowship organization at her school. And she had the girls together. And those girls, they know the shadow of terror that is all around them. They lived with that daily. They had heard stories of, of what happened in Chibok. And they, they, could, they heard the stories of the Paris coming over the Niger border. They knew they were close. They got a letter in the town telling them, we're coming. And that night, the girls were talking about that. They were terrified. What do you think? Are they coming? I don't know. What do you think? And Leia, she stopped them. And she said, if they do come, what will you do? Will you stand for your faith with Jesus? Or would you renounce your faith? And a number of the girls in the room, the story says, said that they would renounce their faith and then just convert back. Well, that would be the easy thing to do. Five of those girls who were taken with Leia were suffocated in the bottom of the truck. They didn't get back. If they had renounced their faith, they would have died that way. So Leia, at that meeting, encouraged her fellow sisters to stand strong, to never renounce your faith. It doesn't matter if they take your life. You still have Jesus. And that's what she did. She was, you hear from patience and comfort and the other girls who were there with her in the school. And she was, Leo was tending to a fellow sick student who couldn't go to classes that day when the terrorists came. And they ran out together and somehow they got separated. And Leia got put on that truck. There were what looked like military members out in front of the gate, and they were loading girls into the trucks. And Leia got on one of those trucks. Her friend, who had been really sick and could hardly move, made it into a ditch and stayed there all night long. So Leia was the only Christian girl, about 20 in that school, who was taken because she was the only one who was prepared to stand for her faith and not renounce it. She is the only one who was not returned because the terrorists would not return her because she chose faith over fear. Consistently, her friends who were with her said she chose faith. We tried to convince her just, just say the, the shahada, and she would not. But that is Leah. That is my daughter. That is your daughter. She is all of our daughters. She could be any one of ours held there in the den of the terrorists. And we must, we must not forget Leah, nor any of the rest of the girls like Deborah Emanuel, who was just stoned to death for, for thanking Jesus for helping her on her test. You know, we cannot... We cannot say that this is climate change. You cannot say that. They're taking the Christians. They're taking the Christian girls. They're forcibly marrying them. They're forcibly converting them. They're raping them and using them as sex slaves. And we cannot stand for this. Secretary Blinken, for politics or for profit, removed Nigeria from the country's particular concern list. That we worked really hard to get them listed. And I am personally offended by that. There has been no explanation for it. Nigeria must be redesignated. Congressman Frank Wolf, the new USERC commissioner, says that we must have a special envoy for Nigeria, somebody who can pick up the phone and get Secretary Blinken on the line right then and there and coordinate with international agencies as well. He has worked long and hard with us on Leia as well. I just really think that we need to choose human rights over politics and profits. We shouldn't be selling Nigeria 
a, a billion dollars in military arms. We shouldn't be providing U.S. aid. They should be on their knees until they address the issue of Christian persecution in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Didi. Uh, yeah, um, we are making progress and we'll close uh, shortly. But uh, as a moderator, just like uh, a pilot, uh, we announced 32,000 above the sea level. So enjoy your ride, or there will be uh, some kind of rough air. So I have this everybody to at least uh, uh, recognize uh, even a uh, uh, barista, uh, uh, barista, him and his wife. Vivian, who's you from Texas? Yes. So thank you, Marissa, and my mathematician, uh, uh, Vivian. Thank you for coming. Now, please, I'll take this liberty because uh, sometimes, uh, uh, Didi, you remember when we were to see uh, Vice President Pence, Father Andrew Mann you know, has just been so tremendous and he has really helped. There are many, many pieces and many, many people who had facilitated. Uh, uh, all of this about religious persecution, issue hostility, being experienced. So we are going to uh, uh, listen to some people who may have some questions. But before then, I would like to give to people, and then in closing, I will bring in the camp president to close us after all of this. But please, I would like uh, Father Mahatma to just uh, uh, share that with us in one minute, 30 seconds, and then also followed by another person who had flown from Nigeria in person of Pastor Itua Igunalo, who pastor a mega church in Lagos, Nigeria. He's here to, with us tonight. So I would like them to just share within one minute, then we make progress to question and answer. Please, I seek your indulgence as your pilot tonight. Thank you. So sorry, I did not know. It's really a surprise, but uh, my name is Father Andre, and uh, with the beautiful help of this wonderful angel, in 2018, I was able to come to DC, went to the White House, and we met with Mr. Frank Gaffney. And I said, you need to start a coalition. And he said, what kind of coalition? I said, you need to start a coalition called Save the Persecuted the Christians. And uh, I thank God that today I see this is growing together in the ark of Noah, not only Christians, because we found out that when we went to defend the persecuted Christians, that 80% of humanity are persecuted for their faith on planet Earth. So we knew that God was calling us not only to save the Christians, but to save every human being who wants to believe in truth and heart and in the spirit. And the Lord Almighty. And for this, we are so proud. And we thank God for such responsibility. I want to tell you a couple of things, Your Excellency. My heart breaks. I myself was 15 hours away from being massacred. I had to live in caves when I was a child and uh, in Lebanon um, at some point. But uh, I want to recommend something, and that would be my contribution. I beg you, you did say you would like for President Biden to contact on the phone, and I know he will do it. If you have the right channels, I can recommend two channels. And with us, I do believe we have most likely the ambassador at large for international religious freedom. I pray with the help of all those who are present here that you can get to meet with him and tell him it is his duty. He can contact the president. The president will contact the president of Nigeria, and it will happen just like that. The second recommendation we have 230 Catholic bishops in the United States of America, and they have so many issues of stewardship and uh, many, many issues. But I think uh, if you can succeed meeting with the president of the Conference of Catholic Bishops here in Washington, D.C., and tell him to speak up, just call it by its name. It is persecution, and the Muslims are not proud of it. You will be doing service to the Muslims if you tell the people they need to stop Islamic indoctrination of a indoctrination that has nothing to do with the Muslim people, with Islam, basically. You will be doing a big favor. And for the rest of us, please pray that all of us will come to a day where we will meet in the freedom of the children of God. Imagine this beautiful setting up in heaven where all of us are sitting and having fun and living forever. May this happen. Amen.
thank you, uh, Father Andrew. And uh, you remember Dee and everyone who is present here, Fred uh, uh, McDonough, you guys remember, it was just a simple memo that all of us, the coalition put together and it uh, landed on the desk of President Trump when Buhari was, it was even 24 hours and uh, President Trump called out called out President Buhari to stop Christian persecution so it can happen as well. That channel is still available. So this time, please, uh, to manage this one minute, uh, Pastor Ituai Godalo, please. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you very much to the panelists and to my bishop and our current president and all the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, it's often said that um, what it takes for terror to unleash itself is not just for people to protest against it, but it's for the righteous to remain silent. And I think the righteous have remained silent for too long, not just in Nigeria, not just in Africa, but all over the world. The persecution against Christians, there's nothing wrong with anybody trying to spread their own religion or convince people in a peaceful way to see things from their point of view. But when it comes to terrorism, attack, aggression, capture of people, then it becomes totally unacceptable. Nigeria has never been this bad before. There's always been a fundamental movement since the time of Uthman Danfodio, 200 years ago, to spread Islam aggressively, the plant of the Quran in the Atlantic Ocean. But now it has assumed unbelievable proportions, where people are slaughtered in broad daylight, where people are captured uh, at any time, where people are speaking in the name of their religion and cutting off people's heads and burying them almost alive where people like myself are afraid even to go from a town to another just for fear of being attacked and being persecuted by bandits, then it's totally ridiculous. And it's time for the entire world to stand up and to stand up aggressively for peace, for justice, for righteousness, for people to express themselves. And not just in Nigeria. There is a calculated move all over the world for there to be a spread of a certain religion above others. Even in the UK, Lord, I hear that there's an increase in movement in the UK. At least so many of your mayors and things are now of a different faith on a country that was planted on the belly and the bottom of Jesus. Let me just tell a quick story and I'll sit down. I run president of a group called Rebuild Nigeria, and I said this story earlier on today. And in Rebuild Nigeria, we're trying to ensure there's dialogue, there's communication, there's peace, there's um, resolution of matters. And then two gentlemen came before us when we did our launch. One was a Muslim, the other was a Christian. And they came and they sat together and they wanted to try and work together to spread peace and common commonality in the terms of dwelling together. And then they then told their story that for 30 years they've been fighting one another. So in fact, the Christian pastor had his arm, had lost an arm in the midst of that struggle. And some of his disciples had lost their lives and they've been fighting one another. And then they said, why did you people come to peace? They said, they brought us together on a table. We decided we we're gonna kill each other after that meeting. But we found that um, we were tied together, so we just had to make peace. So, Mr. Imam, why have you been persecuting the Christians? He says his grandfather told his father, and his father told him that anything Western was unacceptable, and they would do everything that they could to challenge anything Western. And Christianity is the face of Westernization, and that is why it is called Boko. And that is why you have the haram. It is unacceptable. And they must defend their faith to the last drop of their blood. It is a, an ideology that is implanted in people's heads. And therefore, the solution is threefold. There must be a way of 
managing crisis and ensuring security. There must be a way of changing fundamentalism and ideology, and there must be a way of standing firm. Thank you very much. God bless you. To manage our time, uh, the day is far gone. So uh, there will be a few questions I will entertain, and our panelists, please you respond to that. I may take like a one, two, I see two hands, three. Okay, please you can ask your question. Well, if you want to, can you make a little bit of a little Okay, there is my Maybe that is no, better. Yes. No, no, no. Kanchama will come after questions uh, and answer. So he will give us the closing remarks. This is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate all the panelists. And all you have said is very true. And it uh, touches my heart very deeply. And I express my solidarity with all of you. And I agree with all that you have said and you have shared uh, regarding Nigeria. I have a little knowledge of Nigeria, that there is northern Nigeria and southern Nigeria. In one, one part, Muslims are a majority, other part, Christians are a majority. So I see the situation is, uh, if I'm not, uh, not wrong, like 50-50, Muslims and 50% Christians. But I really wonder why uh, Christians are so much persecuted in Nigeria. What are the reasons? And also all over, all over the world, as you said, they see 360 million Christians are persecuted around the world, where Christians are the majority religion in the world as well. Two, uh, two billion and thirty, um, uh, two point three billion Christians all over the world. My question is that. Uh, Whosoever hates us, whosoever persecutes us, we cannot fight alone with, with, with those forces. We need the solidarity of others. So what I want to say that when Christians are persecuted in Nigeria or any other country, do you find uh, regarding Nigeria, do you find Muslims who express solidarity with you, who mourn with you? who come to console you, because I know all Muslims are, um, there are many good Muslims in Nigeria, I don't know much, but around the world. They, they stand uh, with the Christians when they are persecuted. So my question is that, uh, uh, do you find a way that there could be reconciliation and uh, uh, come together those Imams or priests who are of one mind and heart and also some of bring the change in the syllabus which you have, whatever is taught in the madrasas, what is taught in the churches. So instead of becoming enemies, we become friends. So there is a way, and I would like to know what, what are your, your uh, responses. Please. Thank you. Uh, I will take uh, the two questions, please. Uh, we know that so that we'll respond to that. And after the two other hand, okay, please. Please just Sure. This is for our bishops. Uh, Your Excellency, you asked us to uh, pray for Leah and also pray for all the persecuted um, uh, people because of their religions. T tomorrow, right here, 8 o'clock, uh, we have a multi faith prayer virtual for pre uh, religious personal conscience. And we ask if you can come and join with us to pray with us with all the religions, to pray for the religious Christian of conscience, because together with just not Christian, we have Buddhist, we have Catholic, we have uh, uh, Baptist, and all of the religion, and we call that you can come and pray with us, same room here tomorrow at 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. The, who, the last time I saw, okay, it's like, uh, other than that, please, uh, you can respond quickly to that. Uh, you know that, but at least the other first question about uh, uh, Islam, uh, Christian uh, uh, dialogue, maybe, my Lord uh, Bishop, sir, at least we can respond to that. Uh, 
it was possible to cut that one point for us. Well, you see, we are dealing with uh, a situation that uh, needs a lot of reflection. You see, when those 41 people were killed in my diocese, three days later, the Muslim community came to pay me a visit, and they gave me 250,000 Naira in support of those who were wounded. Now, you see, there's something that is so funny. And that thing is this. When you have Muslim leaders who are not in control of their population, who are not in control, then you begin to see the dynamics that is going on within the Islamic group. One of those who reacted after the stoning to death and the burning of uh, Deborah, uh, Deborah Manuel, that happened almost three, four weeks ago in Nigeria. One of the first person to react was the Sultan of Sokoto, the symbol of the Islamic leadership in Nigeria. These guys rushed to his palace to lynch him too. At least that was what we were made to believe. He declared recently the day that the Muslim feast, you know, they have to look at the moon. He declared the day that it has to be on this date. The others decided another date. So there's always this uh, rebellion group that are always looking you are not Muslim enough. Either your beard is not as long as mine, or it should be shorter than you. And that will be enough reason to go after you. So I understand what you are saying. Sometimes we sit down with this Muslim leader and say, but what are you doing? You can see your boys and say, they will come to us secretly. We cannot do anything. Just go against what they are fighting for, you become the target. They go from after you. And that's why we need this world coalition to say enough. You people cannot frustrate the entire world and become problem to everybody. And those who can do it are there, keeping quiet, looking at the situation the way it is. And that is why this meeting is so important. We must use our influence together to make sure that we bring this situation to an end. It is a situation that can be uh, can be resolved, and it will need your your resolve, your commitment, and your prayers. We thank you for inviting us for that prayer, and we will try to be there. Um, as a Christian girl, grow up in a Muslim society, forced to study Islam since first grade. If you did not pass the Islamic test, you won't be able to move to the upper grade. I would say one thing. I'm grateful to stand here in this place or in conference like that as a Christian, and I don't have to apologize to any religious minority for what? my fellow Christian than somewhere in the world. Christian are not responsible for the way others treat them. So, and the other thing, if you look in the situation in every persecution, in every persecution situation in any country, when we are attacked, we don't respond the same way. Terrorists, we don't respond the same way because as a Christian, we know we we know God is what is tell us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That's how we stand as a Christian. But we are not responsible to go and ask for reconciliation. This is there's too many problems that Muslims do have, and only thing we can do at the end of everything, we forgive and pay for them. That's what you can do. 
but we are not responsible like to tell them. We know how to some of us comply with many injustice and many laws. We they comply in order for them to live their peaceful lives, to keep peace. But at the end, there's many problems in Islamic teaching and in Islam, and this has to do with, own, with their own way. It is not our responsibility as a Christian to fix their problems other than to pray for them. Even though in the situation of persecution, we pray for them during the, our trial, during what we face, we just pray for them. That's all we can do. So thank you. I think I'm going to slightly disagree with Miriam in what she's just said, because only partly because there's it was an African saint, it was Saint Augustine, who said that you should pray as if the entire outcome depends upon God, which is what you said. But he also said you must work as if the entire outcome depends upon you. So I think you have to do both of those things. And are there things that we can do to build bridges and alliances and coalitions, as Lord Bishop said to us a few minutes ago? Yes, there are things we can do. I'll give you some examples. I've been, I've been sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party, my, my children. My children, my, my children have a WhatsApp group called Badge of Honor uh, because they've been sanctioned with me. Now, why do I tell you? Why was I sanctioned? It's because, yes, I've campaigned about Hong Kong, I've campaigned about Tibet, I've campaigned about Taiwan, but primarily it was because I've campaigned about Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, where more than a million Uyghur Muslims are incarcerated. And I've campaigned because of the atrocities that have been committed by the Burmese military against Rohingya Muslims. Why? Because I passionately believe in Article 18 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is not a gospel tract. It is not a religious tract. It is what the nations of the world did in the aftermath of the Holocaust and the atrocities that have been committed primarily against Jewish people. And in 1948, Universal Declaration says in Article 18, everyone has the right to believe. Everyone has the right not to believe. Everyone has the right to change their belief. And when that was fashioned here in the United States by the nations coming together, they understood the importance of learning to live together, of coexistence alongside one another. And we have to provide platforms for those Muslims who share the tenets, of the 1948 Universal Declaration. Countries like Nigeria are signatories to it. You must hold people up to what they have signed up to. Pakistan is a signatory to it. There are debates in many great nations about these things. We recently brought to Westminster the um, Grand Mufti of the Al-Azhar Mosque in Cairo. Why? Because he has been speaking out about coexistence. He has said it's wrong to execute people for breaking blasphemy laws. He has spoken out about abductions. He's spoken out about many of the things all of us are passionate about here. So we must provide platforms where we can. One of the people I met this morning when I walked in is someone who would be accused of blasphemy because he describes himself as an Ahmadi Muslim. Why should he not describe himself as an Ahmadi Muslim? In the United Kingdom, a man got in a car and drove from Yorkshire to Glasgow. He took out a gun and he murdered a shopkeeper. The shopkeeper was an Amity Muslim who had had the temerity to put in his shop window, I wish to wish my Christian customers a happy Easter. He was murdered for doing that by someone from a radical Islamist jihadist ideological background. We have to separate those two things, as I think everyone on this platform has done tonight. We understand the difference between the ideology, we understand how things are done in the name of religion, and we who are religious, and those who are not, we have to work in order to create circumstances where we respect one another and coexist with one another. I'll finish by commending to you a wonderful book by the former chief rabbi in Great Britain, the late Jonathan Sachs. And that book is called The Dignity of Difference. The Dignity of Difference. Every person is made in the image of God and therefore, regardless of their color, their creed, their orientation, their gender, their class, their ability range, 
they are precious because they are made in God's image from the womb to the tomb. And that's why we stand for human rights. That's why we stand for the kinds of things that we've been saying tonight. That's why we stand for Leah Sharibu and girls like her. All right, honestly, I will uh, try to, because I would like uh, His Eminence to speak. I know a lot of Barista Imo will talk. Will, I know you want to say something, please. Uh, eh? Okay, please say, uh, I'm not bringing you to this podium, but you can say, amplify your voice from this, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, uh, honestly, I, uh, I my plane as a pilot has actually entered Washington DC space and I'm about to land. <laughs> but uh, I will still, this is the final and it's final, very final. And it is. Thank you. Thank you. I take the prerogative of being the organizer of the global campaign for religious prisoner of conscience. And I'd like to explain, it'll be a miss for me not explain why there's so many young people here, young faces here, <laughs> because I'm responsible. I've been charged by the Earth Summit Steering Committee to mobilize and rally the young leaders, the next generation of leaders to continue the fight. I'm here to thank you all because no one could have done better to motivate, and mobilize, and inspire these young leaders here, leaders of the future, than the story of Lia Charibu. So the message here will sink in, I know, and I trust that tonight. And I hope to see you all again, motivated, inspired, and please get involved because many of your peers of your same age are suffering, and they're the heroin here. So, Please join us to continue this fight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, um, I thank, uh, I thank uh, um, my colleagues, uh, Teye, uh, uh, AJ, Jumoke uh, Akintelo, even Elizabeth Dooley, and all of you who have actually been supporting, even all of us. Uh, Dr. Gloria Pudu, yes, my own person, like we call it in Nigeria. So this time around, I would like to. We are going to conclude, close this special meeting with uh, a closing remark from His Eminence, Christian Association of Nigeria in person of Dr. Samson Ayokunle. Please, Your Eminence, sir. You have the floor. Good evening, everybody. I want to join others in showing our appreciation to you all. When you know that you are not fighting alone, others are fighting behind you, you will not be discouraged to continue to fight on. 
for the past six years when I took the up the leadership of the church in Nigeria, it has been hell on earth because we have to face radical Islam in Nigeria as never before. And I've said it again and again, it is because they have the backing of the government. Government has always been denying it, but the evidence on ground shows all that they are solidly behind it. Number one, if the, government, the president of Nigeria came out to say that the Fulanis that the, who are predominantly Muslims, terrorizing the entire land, carrying illegal ammunitions, are Fulani from outside the country. Has he not indicted immigration, which is under his control? What, what of the custom department? What are they doing? Why has government not put them to order for allowing illegal immigrants to come to Nigeria and terrorize the entire land? Why didn't he query the Director General of Custom Service for allowing illegal ammunition to be in the hands of terrorists and other people who are uh, troubling our nation? The police is complicit. Even the appointment of government, the appointment of people to keep positions, since the government keep it to me, have been skewed. It's lopsided. One religion has been, have been favored. The director general of immigration is Muslim. The inspector general of police is Muslim. The chief, the, the chief of army staff is Muslim. The minister for, for police affairs is Muslim. The uh, advice, legal, the, the security advisor to the government is Muslim. Everybody is Muslim. In a nation where we have 100 million Christians, under about 100 million Muslims, and we have competency in both religions, it was never so bad. So this government has blood in its hand. I've always said that that they have no way of escaping from the trouble that is on the ground. The government went and joined organizations of Islamic conference, took the nation to join it with military fiat. And since that time, from the observer status to permanent status, when Nigeria is not an Islamic nation, Nigeria, for God's sake, in the constitution is a secular nation. Section 10 of the constitution says that. But why has Nigeria become a member of Islamic conference? Who, the, that decision didn't go to the National Assembly. It was a military head of state who was a Muslim that did that. But the rest have continued to support it. And Nigeria is financing many Islamic organizations, not less than 13, with our common weight, without our consent. That is the part of the Islamization policy that we are talking of in Nigeria. The International Criminal Court is complicit. I've written letters and letters to ICC. We even have a, cent a Nigerian center of ICC at the Secretariat of the Christian Association of Nigeria in Abuja. When the, the prosecutor general came to Nigeria, let's find the fact that he received our letters of complaint. He went to see to meet with government agencies alone. He did it. Tell us he was coming. He left without seeing us. That is not the way to, to do justice. At least if we were mad, you need to hear how mad people speak by listening to us when we came, when you came. I sent a letter after that to accuse him of complicity. That if more people die in Nigeria, he must be, uh, be held responsible for being part of that evil. The local leaders are complicit. They kept quiet with many people being slaughtered every day, every day. I think this thing, because the Nigerian population is so large, so, so it should be reduced through, through, through untimely death. 
It's, it's, it's not something we can say, I am, I'm on program in the evening tomorrow as a speaker, and uh, I will still speak about the problem we are passing through. Politicians say that the problem is not about Islamization, and some li Muslim leaders also support that. They say it's economy. If it was economy, for God's sake, why should they go to the church to be suiting people? Are the church people the people in government? Are we the one in control of the economy? Let me tell you, the oil west in Nigeria, which is in the southern part of Nigeria, where the population is predominantly Christian, 80% of the oil world is managed by the Muslims from the north. If they are, and in the, in the governance of Nigeria, since Nigeria came into be, about 70% of our leaders have been Muslims. Why are the Muslims from the north poor? Why should they have economic problems? They should be irresponsible, not the Christian South. The Christian South is more developed. All the Nas, I'm telling you, as the moderator said, Nigeria is still the largest economy in Africa, despite the fact that many companies are running away because of insecurity. We are still the largest economy. It has potentials, but because of the religious bigotry, foolishness, madness, the, the, the trying to impose one religion upon another in a very tacit way. Uh, they are bringing Nigeria down. I spoke to the World Council of Churches last, in the last two weeks when we met in Geneva. That your quietness is very suspicious. Is either there is wickedness in this organization or that Nigerian people are, are less human. Otherwise, people cannot be killed like this unless some, until somebody protested. The public issues didn't make any statement on Nigeria, despite the shooting of 40 people in the, at St. Francis uh, Catholic Church on one day. And after that, they have gone to shoot people again in other churches in the north. The chairman of Khan in Kaduna State is here, Reverend Joseph Ayab. He, he, two week, one, a week ago, they shot people in another college church and in the basket church, of which I'm being a leader. So is this the way we are going to continue? And nobody is talking about it. More people have died in Nigeria to terrorism than any other place in the world. Please, we, we want to thank you for projecting all these things, and we want you to project it more and more. I've been to uh, DC to see Chris Smith when he was the chair of uh, Human Rights and Freedom of Religion to present these things to him. We are shouting. We are not, we are not going to stop shouting until we see changes. The, thank God we are holding the leaders of Islam responsible. Last week in Oyo State, I and the Sultan of Sokoto, we are co-chairman of Nigeria Interreligious Council. And we met 30 Muslims, 30 Christians from all over the Federation. And we went through our situation. We have many Muslims that are against what is happening in Nigeria. But we have the fanatics who are also in government who are in government, who are in the military, who are in the police, aiding and abetting these things. Why did our government refuse to mention the people behind the terrorism? They first of all told us that they knew them, but later they said they will not mention them. Why? Who is afraid of what? Thank you for what you are doing. May the Lord help us to overcome this evil. So that the whole of Africa might not be swept under the carpet. Thank you very much. Yes, um, your, your Eminence, uh, they would like to have uh, some picture with you, sir, in the, uh, on the high table. Uh, Father Andre uh, Pasetua, please come. Um, all right, thanks, all of you, for coming. Eh?
Please, you can come. Yes, please, you can go. Okay. Leah is the face of so many persecuted people whose names and stories the world does not know and probably never will. Here in the United States, we seem to be largely unaware of the genocide that still rages on in Nigeria. On the 19th of February 2018, 110 young girls were kidnapped by the terrorist group Boko Haram. Not long after, the terrorists freed all the girls but one, Leah. 14 at the time of her capture. She would have been released also with the other girls, but was held back by her captors because she refused to deny her Christian faith. She refused to deny her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sadly, Leah is not the only Christian in Nigeria enduring hardships for her faith. Islamic terrorists and Fulani militants kill hundreds, hundreds of Christians in Nigeria each year. But even across the ocean and in an entirely different culture, she became a hero to me as I heard about her faith standing for Christ in the midst of unfettered persecution. We need to appeal to the governing authorities in our country to put pressure on the Nigerian government. In Parliament, we will continue to work with you for Leah's release and for an end to the persecution of Christians in Nigeria. Leah Sherabu is standing firm for her faith and paying a high price for doing so. Let's stand with her 